not be people who are in hiding. Let us have our sin exposed. Let our, our ways of life be exposed to the light of who you are. That we would know that it was that Jesus bore our sins and that because of what he has done for us on the cross, that we can have a relationship with you. Someone that is very near and close to us that knows the innermost parts of who we are. God, I pray that you would bring us out into the light. Let us not stay in hiding. Let us not stay in the darkness. Let us see the truth of your word and how it impacts and shapes us and moves us to be more like Jesus. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You have a seat. Well, good morning, Tara. So here, here's my question this morning for us. What, why do trials come into our life? Why are there these, these great difficulties? If God is good and loving, why, why does he allow these things to happen? None of us can really give the immediate answer when difficulties in our life. We can't say God is doing this because ultimately his plan is going to work out this exact way for me. But we know certain things are there. We know sometimes trials are there to distill us. They, they begin to make us more pure. They rely on us. The Bible talks about it like a refining process. They strengthen us to go through these difficult things. Sometimes it's to discipline us. Sometimes we're suffering in our lives and have trials in our lives because we have disobeyed the Lord. And frankly, we end up in a place where his favor isn't there and there's great difficulty because of that. Sometimes though, the, the trials are actually there to put us on display. There are times where God trusts us with difficulty. Now, that's, a, that's an inversion of what we usually think about. It's, it's can, can I have faith in God enough to get through my day? But when God puts us on display, he's saying, I, I trust you. I, I have faith in you that you will display what it is to follow me through difficult circumstances. And we all know this, at least. It's not easy to endure trials. It's a hard process for all of us. At times, the, the trials seem even larger than we are, and that's a good moment because we have to look at God through those trials. President Lincoln had said this, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. See, sometimes we think about trials that display us as being suffering and how we do with the difficult things because we're prone to forget when we're giving God's blessings, when we're giving privilege. These are trials and tests as well. What will you do with the opportunities to steward over great things? T today we're going to be going through the series, The People of God, and looking at the character of two kings as they pass by each other. King Saul, who is on a meteoric descent. Th these chapters that we'll go through and roughly 11 of them. I wanted a time machine this week to go back and talk to past Ed, who put 11 chapters together for this sermon, and punch him in the face, and then come back here and be able to preach. Uh, but there's a reason why past Ed had wisdom on this. It, it actually is gonna show a, a broad story of how Saul is dropping, and how David is ascending into his kingship. And what I want us to do is be able to focus on the character displayed, what's revealed about these two men. And then we'll see the Lord also holding together the whole fabric of all the circumstances in all these settings over these 11 chapters. So here's the roadmap for today. First, we'll look at the character and course of King Saul. It'll be on display, unchanging. His character will tell on him again and again. Then we'll see contrasting to that, the character of David and how he also will be incredibly predictable. Your character will tell on you every time but he'll be one who is faithful and live out these well-worn paths of following God that don't change even though the pressures change on him. And then we'll see the sovereign place of God. Because in the midst of dizzying trials, whether they're difficulties or dealing with our blessings, we have to see the Lord as larger than all those trials. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. If you don't, simply put your hand up and someone will bring you one. Uh, we're obviously not going to go verse by verse through all these chapters. We're, we're just kind of working through the whole story. So 1 Samuel 18, I'm going to start at uh, verse 8 and read 8 through 11 this morning. Then we'll pray and spend the rest of our time in the Word. 1 Samuel 18, verse 8. And Saul was very angry. And this saying displeased him. 
He said they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Let's pray together. Father, we stand at the start of another week. We recognize we mark the beginning of this week as the day Jesus rose from the dead when you took the things that were no longer a death and made life eternal out of them. So, Lord, as we face this week, we want to be men and women who have hope and faith in you. Would you please show us, even through today's word, how to follow you this week? And Lord, we ask that you would make from days and weeks that can sometimes seem mundane to us, faithful men and women of us, that we can see your glory on display, you who make things and call things into existence that previously were not. We're excited to follow you, Lord. We ask this day that you would help us to see Jesus, in whose name we now pray. Amen. So what sort of man is King Saul? First, a quick review on how he got to be king in the first place. Israel had been following God out of the promised land through the wilderness, ultimately into the promised land, and things are still difficult. They've arrived at that destination on their GPS, but there are still new challenges ahead. And they look around, and they're worried. The first look that worries them is at themselves. They say, "We're, we're inadequate for this task because our leadership isn't good. They see Samuel's sons and say, we don't have a future in and of ourselves, and we feel so inadequate that we need something more, a king. They had fears without. They looked at angry kings around them and wanted to declare war and said, we're not secure. We need a king. And they looked with envy next to them and said, these guys have strong military heroes of pageantry, might, and wealth. We want a king. And the entire time, their own inadequacies, the entire time with their own fears outside, their entire time with their own envy, they neglected and ignored that God was their living king, that he protected them, that he gave them identity, that he should be the envy of all the other people rather than the other way around. So God gives them King Saul. Now, Saul is a PR relations specialist dream. He's the political candidate to have. He cuts a great figure. He's taller than everyone else. He, he's handsome. He's got those movie star kind of looks. And, and, he, and he's wealthy. His family has money, so he's probably wearing the right things. Image-wise, he's everything that they could want on the outside. But if character is like a light that really helps people to see us after a while, image is like a shadow that can actually blind us from seeing other people or even being seen ourselves. Saul is an image that looks good, but right from the start, there is a fatal flaw of character that gets proved out. If you remember, when when he was uh, anointed, um, he he was looking for part of his flock that had wandered away. And what we see in Saul is he's not a man who sees the Lord as part of his narrative day by day. The Lord's name is on his lips at times, to be sure. He'll acknowledge, and uh, when other people bring up things of of spiritual life, he'll follow through and pray, but it's not his driving force. When we meet him, they're looking for this lost livestock. He comes to the end of himself, and because he's at the end of himself, he assumes this is the end of the mission. Time to go home. If, If I can't do it, if I can't think of it, what else is there? See, men and women of the flesh are always ultimately only reliant on themselves. There are often men and women who are busy, sometimes successful, but regularly exhausted, because the well that they're drawing from will run dry. If you really believe you can get through what God is bringing to you on your own emotions, your own intellect, your own physical attributes, I don't think you've really thought about what our calling is as Christians and what it takes for us to get there. If you rely only on self, those wells will all run dry. Saul was ready to head home when his servant reminded him, you know, we're actually near the the guy who is the spiritual leader of our entire people. Why don't we go sit with him a little while, see what his counsel is, ask him to pray. No, Saul's the kind of guy who says, oh, sure, that's the right thing to do. 
but never crossing his mind. It's the big character flaw. He's a fool. See, Proverbs, that, that book of wisdom written by a king for those who would be raised in those royal households of privilege, said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Saul is not wise. The, the fear of the Lord wasn't his beginning thought. His beginning thought was, what can I do? How can I fix things? Where am I going? How do I make this life mine? Because of that, he's a man who's terribly insecure. He, he's disconnected from God. So he has to trust in something else for his stability. Something has to anchor him down and give him some assurance. And God's called him to be king. And in the moment when he's supposed to step forward, he's hiding where they drop off bags for the big ceremony. He's a man who's completely insecure because he realizes he's about to try to do what God has called him to do, but only in his own strength. And he's going to fail at that. He's not always without consideration for the Lord. Moments he prays, moments he praises. But the Lord is like a slice. He's got a pie chart of all of his life. Things I have to do, things others have to do for me, things I need God for. He's reduced God to a narrow wedge and says, saying, the, the whole thing, this is God in my life, and God has to work me through this part, this part, and this part. As a result, he's incredibly unstable. He, he, he lacks wisdom. We see that. He's a foolish man. He lacks the means. We see that, and he becomes inconsistent in his responses. This was a guy who wanted King David in his house when David was playing the liar to help soothe him. This was a guy who rewarded David when David beat Goliath, and now we see him trying to make a David kebab twice, just sitting there getting angry because he can't change certain things. So he takes this position of privilege that God gave him and now tries to kill the one that God has next in line. Other moments in the narrative in those 11 chapters? He's going to give praises that seem almost cloyingly sweet, but I think he's sincere about David. And he'll cry out and say, David, my son, is that your voice? I repent. I'm so sorry I tried to kill And then try to kill him again. He's a reactionary man. The Proverbs of the New Testament is the book of James. And it talks about a man just like this. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. This is the following of the king of flesh, the servant who serves himself. He's an unstable person. He's just a reactionary person. Okay, emotions are important. Uh, on the Myers-Briggs temper indicators, I'm an ENFP. So it's, it's emotion, I feel, I perceive, that's who I am. But they can't drive you. Emotions are just reactions and indicators to show you when something's wrong and needs to be looked at, thought at more carefully, it can never be the engine. It's just the check lights that come up sometimes. For Saul, his reactions are purely out of emotion. Phrases like, he was very afraid, he was very angry, everything is just driving him. People, well, let me hit quiet on that thing. It's already on, do not disturb. Okay. Um, emotions leave Saul in a place where he's just driven by other things. He never considers, because God isn't the first thing, it's just stimulus response. This is an amoeba. This is how amoebas live every day. They have some stimulus and they just respond. Higher order of life beings actually have this moment in between, a gap moment, where there's stimulus and you begin to consider, what are my options? You might pray and say, what can I do about this? The people of God are not called to be amoeba people. But that's exactly what happens when we become men and women who respond just out of our emotions. We take God out of the equation, and our center becomes the center of how to respond in these things. 1 Samuel 18, 12, we, we see Saul's emotions driving everything. It says, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people, and David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And Saul saw that he had great success. He stood in fearful awe of him. But all of Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. But when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid. 
So Saul was David's enemy continually. Here are the things that drive this guy's path. He becomes envious. Someone else has something more. They're singing songs of tens of thousands being killed by David. He shouldn't have that spotlight. I should. He's a man who's driven by fear. He's afraid of what's going to happen, what God is doing, and he can't yield to it and trust the character of God. He has to try to work it himself. The, and anger. The, these are the forces that drive Saul. The man's out of control. He's never learned the spiritual life lesson that just because things are out of your control doesn't mean they're out of control. That forces us to trust the Lord and not just ourselves. And he's never been there. And he has no self-control. Proverbs 25, 28, some more wisdom that could have helped King Saul says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. When your emotions become the things that drive you, you just expose yourself to being completely devastated. Something always has to drive us. We're designed to be followers. No original thoughts. We're just inspired by imitating other people or what the Lord has done. No original leaders. We're following after things that have been done again and again before us. For Saul, his emotions drive him, but he's also very susceptible to the court of public opinion. Because he doesn't have a heavy center, because the Lord's not in his life, something else is going to drive. Sometimes it's emotion, sometimes it's other people. And in these 11 chapters, there are multiple times where he is committed, I'm going to kill David. He's pulling together his team. Everyone's plan is kill David on three, go. And then his son will come in and say, you know, David's been pretty good to you. You shouldn't do this. And he'll say, oh, that's right. We're not going to kill David anymore. As soon as someone says it, this, this is a guy who would go up an elevator with Karl Marx and be a communist, down with Adam Smith, and be a capitalist. The latest influence seems to be the thing that most moves him. 1 Samuel 19. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant, David, because he has not sinned against you, because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand and struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. But yet he'll try three more times in the midst of these chapters. By verse 10, this ended at verse 6, Saul's back to wanting to kill David. He's throwing spears again. See, when our emotions or, or just the latest voice we heard are the things that drive us, we're going to be people who are like that cork in the water that James talked about. One moment we seem godly, the next moment we're just carried away. He flips and flops constantly. His effusive language and, and how moved he is in his repentances mean nothing. It's just the expressions of emotion. His character displays again and again who he is. It doesn't display that he's sincere only in his hatred for David. It doesn't just display he's sincere in these immediate repentances. What it displays is he is an unstable man. Ultimately, at the bottom of it all, he is a self-protective man. One of the great church fathers, uh, Bob Dylan, said, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil, maybe the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. Saul finds himself ultimately serving one master, himself. What's good for Saul? We saw in the past when he was supposed to put a kingdom to death, he, he kept the king alive. And, and he was supposed to sacrifice all the livestock, and he kept the best for himself. He kept the best, most influential guy, because I think in Saul's mind, he thought, I can use this man someday, and he now owes me. He kept the best of the livestock, because he thought sacrificing it to God, that's not worth as much as me having all this wealth. Ultimately, he served himself. And now with God calling David to the throne, serving himself meant destroying God's plan. 1 Samuel 20, verse 30. Saul's anger again was kindled against Jonathan, his son who tried to protect David, and he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Ancient Near Eastern insults are awesome sometimes. That's a good one. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness, M meaning she should be embarrassed that she ever gave birth to you? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die the one who he swore would not die. 
See, this, this is the same warning and condemnation that Jesus gives to Peter. When, when Jesus in Matthew 16 reveals everything about the Christ event that was secret to that point, and he says, here's what's going to happen. They're gonna take me to Jerusalem. They're gonna examine me and find me lacking. And they're gonna bring me outside the city, crucify me, kill me, bury me. I will be raised on the third day and I will return to establish my kingdom. And Peter says, may it never be. I think he stopped listening the moment they said, he'll be crucified and killed. He, he didn't hear resurrection, he didn't hear return. Those things conflicted with his plan when it was Jesus being taken, tried, and crucified. And Jesus' response is, get behind me, Satan, because your mind is set on the things of man, not the things of God. If the big picture is I ultimately serve myself, the goal of my life is I need to be comfortable, happy, whole as I see whole, doing what I want, competing against other people as I see that I should, you're in a place that will easily leave you in a place where you're against what God is doing. And his implosion of life is not small. When our hearts turn from God, it can be subtle for a little while, but eventually it's gonna be a nightmare. He tries to kill his son, Jonathan, because Jonathan, in following God, is following after David, and he tries to spear him. He kills the priests of God. There's a city of priests, and they've helped David out because they see his godliness, and he has them all killed. The people won't listen to him. They won't follow King Saul anymore, so he gets an Edomite, Doag the Edomite, and they kill them all except for one priest. He, in chapter 28, he no longer hears from God. He asks for dreams, he tries to pray, there's nothing. He, his heart has been so moved to himself, God has just let him go his own way. And ultimately in that same chapter when he can't hear from God and he wants something in his life now that he's desperate, he, he goes to a sorcerer, he goes to a witch, a spiritist. He's the guy who had ordered these be banned in Israel and now he's going to use it. He's totally unstable, shows up in disguise, and Samuel, risen from the dead, comes and speaks to him and said, you could have had it if you were faithful, but now you're gonna to die tomorrow. That's the lament of it all. What could have been is tragic for Saul, but he couldn't find the Lord. Now David kind of works opposite in every way of Saul. As David's rising in the midst of Saul's demise, we see that David's relationship with the Lord was always the center, again and again. See, Proverbs and the wisdom of Proverbs need to speak against Saul to correct him. David is a guy who's a warrior and a poet, so he's not just this stern, terse, tough guy. His heart is actually on his sleeve in the midst of all of his courage, and he writes psalms that can only tell us again and again in the midst of suffering, many written while he was on the run when Saul was trying to kill him. He relies on the Lord. 1 Samuel 17, 33, when David first comes into the scene, he's getting ready to go into battle against Goliath. And it says, Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth. And he's been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed it. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And his heart is on his sleeve, and what he does is his whole story, his great success moments, are told with the Lord being the center of the story. It's usually a good tip to be able to tell how someone views the Lord in their life. When they talk about their successes, is it just about them? When you talk about your successes, do you tell the story of just what a great call you made, how smartly and shrewdly you worked out the deal, how brilliant you were in raising your kids or getting into the school of your choice? Are you able to, like David, say, here's the story of my great moments, where I had these great victories over wild animals, and I'm not telling them to impress you, I'm telling them to share my confidence and perhaps give you confidence of the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion. See, where Saul had no place for God, God said to David, this was a man after my own heart. Here's the heart that that is. It's a heart that lives for the glory of God. Everything that David does, how does this reflect on God in my story? 
everything that he does. He brings up again and again that he desires to see the Lord. He'll say in his Psalms, that's the one desire of his heart. Even when he sins and falls in Psalm 51, he says, God, restore me so that I can teach other people your way and they'll be converted to you because that will bring glory to you. In his triumphs and in his tragedies, the man pauses to say, God, where do I bring you glory in all of this? That's a heart after God's. And he's humble. Where Saul was insecure and he saw his weaknesses and couldn't move on, David sees his weaknesses and is actually grateful for what God is doing. Saul says to him after he's killed Goliath, you get to marry uh, my daughters, my daughter. And uh, David's response is, who am I? I I'm a little guy from Jesse's house, a nobody from Bethlehem. Who am I to get to marry a king's daughter and become a king's son-in-law? And when it's time to give a dower, he says, who am I? I'm poor, but, but God will work this out. Um, Saul, by the way, says, we can go sort of untraditional for the dowry instead of money. If you will give me 100 Philistine foreskins, uh, we will consider that an okay dowry. Uh, David goes out and doubles it. So this is one of those passages in the Bible that you, you really don't find in flannel graph too often of <laughs> David giving the dowry to Saul. But there it is, always confident in the Lord and what he's doing. He's humble and able to move forward. He's the one who's, who's, when he's even on the run, will say, preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. See, this gets to the heart of humility. Y humility isn't just beating yourself up. That leaves you where Saul was. Y humility is saying, my, my weaknesses will not define me to the point of me walking in shame. My weaknesses are opportunities for me to rely on God. That's humility. And it takes your strengths and doesn't say, I'm so strong that I can now do this and I'll tell the story just about me. It says, I can live with my strengths and giftedness without pride, without having that become my identity. Humility takes who we are honestly and honestly is able to say, God gets the glory in this. He will work through this life. And therefore, David is just consistent as can be, faithful. When God speaks to him, he listens. There's a time when one of the prophets says to him, you need to go to Gad, you need to leave Israel and actually head to this place where you, you, a lot of the enemies are, but you'll be safe there. And it says David departed and left and went there. He listens when the prophets speak. When he's in crisis in chapter 23, his first response, not his last, is we need to pray. We need to actually follow through on asking God and not just be the amoeba person. And it's predictable when he spares Saul's life. 1 Samuel 24, when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe, and afterwards David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up, left the cave, and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of the men who say, behold, David seeks you harm? Behold, this day. Your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put my hand out against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see there's no wrong or treason in my hands. I've not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the Proverbs of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom 
has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. You get the moment? 3,000 guys looking for David and his ragtag group. They're hiding in a cave, not walking around freely, and into the cave walked Saul because he just has to take a leak. The Bible's very honest. There can be moments that seem ignoble in our lives that God redeems. And everyone near David, all the outside influence, and kill him. They're, they're even making it a, a spiritual moment. This is what God meant when he said he's going to make you king. You just have to go kill him. But David is so practiced at godliness that he realizes, I can't be for the Lord and against the Lord's anointed. It won't work that way. So even against the pressure of all of his peers who dress this thing nicely in religious language, he says it can't be. Takes the piece off and feels badly that he cuts the guy's robe. The guy's been trying to kill him, hunts him down. This is the character of David. He, he's someone who constantly is thinking about the Lord and his story, and he's so consistent and faithful that even after Saul turns on him again and will try to kill him, David will have another chance. And the people will say, God's delivered him, finish him off. But he doesn't. He just lets again Saul know, I was here and could have killed you, but I didn't. See, that's a consistency of faithfulness because it really was about God. Here's how I know that it was tested and tried twice. Because I'll tell you, I've been the guy before who has done something godly once and said it didn't work the way I thought it would. I ended up being mistreated because I was good to somebody. I ended up losing financially because I was helping somebody else. I'm not doing that again. And a similar situation would come up and I would work towards self-protection. Not David. His center truly is the Lord. This did him no good ultimately. He honored the Lord and it didn't personally at that moment benefit him. The, Saul will eventually say, I'm still going to try to kill you. The moment comes up again and he repeats it. See, that's consistency of character. When you're doing things for the Lord, the response for you isn't what you're seeking. It's not, I serve the Lord because it makes me feel good. I serve the Lord because it benefits me. Hey, it may at times, but the consistency of David, that well-worn path is, I serve the Lord, period. Good times or bad times. Valley of the shadow of death or the view from the palace, I serve the Lord. And he's concerned for the name of God and the people of God. His character is so on display to those outside that they recognize it. Saul's son doesn't want the dynasty to continue. Jonathan says, this is a godly man. I actually want him to be king. He gives him his armor and his sword. He says, you're, you're the guy. I see that. Other people in the kingdom defect and leave Saul, fall off David, because they see it. Even his enemies see him as the one who really is the king. It reminds me of when St. Paul is writing to Timothy, and in the third chapter he'll say, consider those who are going to be elders in the church. Make sure they have a good reputation within and a good reputation without. David's living that way. Saul was self-protective. David constantly is thinking about the greater picture, God and the people of God. I said in the sermon a couple weeks ago, it's, it's worth repeating a grid through which we can think through that helps us to develop this godly character. Any decision we're making, we first ask, is it what God wants? Does it square with the Bible? Is, is it in line with the character of God? Does it honor the commands I know that are there? Am I being rash? Am I just being an amoeba person or am I being patient? I, I probably should get some counsel. Proverbs talks about in a multitude of counsel, there's just wisdom. I probably should pray about it. The Bible says pray about everything. Is it what God wants? Am I being rash? And finally, is it body-minded? Is this just me looking out for me and trying to be moral about it? Am I actually concerned about the community, the people of God? Ultimately, David is a king who really reflects the heart of God. And make no mistake, God is in charge here. He's king. It was the root of this whole process. He's the one who set Saul up as king. He's the one who withdrew his spirit for his demise. He's the one who came upon David as anointing with his spirit. He's the one who will bring David forward to the throne. Brought the endurance of good and bad character. Just revealed it. God is king. What Israel had forgotten, God never abdicated. Sometimes there are truths, little maxims, that make things easy to understand as a concept. And you see them lived out and you say, ah, 
That makes sense. Proverbs 21 says that the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he'll turn it wherever he will. All their fears their kings wouldn't be good enough were unfounded. The king of kings could turn the heart of any king, those who threatened them or those who led them. So, so where's the fear in your life? Where's the place where you think, I can't face these circumstances alone? They're greater than I am. Where's that place of envy in your life where you think, man, other people, whether they care about the Lord or not, have these things that I really want so that I can get through these things? If those things get large, the Lord will get smaller. It'll be like looking at the Lord through the inverse of a telescope. Those problems get big, and he'll just get tiny until you forget all about him. But if you understand, he's the one who can turn the king's heart. He's, he's the one who directed the paths of this one's demise and this one's ascent. You can trust any of those pieces with him. Even yourself, he can turn your heart. There's one moment where there's hope in this passage for Saul. God comes upon him and he prophesies with the other prophets and he's a different man because his heart was a natural heart of flesh. I mean, we can call him a monster, but frankly, everybody I meet, church and unchurched, are part monster. It's just a matter of are we monstrous saints or saintly monsters. And he was just a monstrous saint for the most part, except the moment the Spirit came upon him and he's prophesying. He's speaking things of God for the benefit of the people of God that are true, but only because the Spirit came upon his heart. See, there are things we cannot change in ourselves. And I just appeal to you to hear this. If you look at the Bible as a way to modify yourself, you will become a Skinnerian behaviorist who looks good on the outside and has restrained themselves, but is still as wicked as Saul on the inside. You cannot fix yourself. It's the domain only of God to be able to change the hearts of men, women, and children. And he does. He was involved in this whole process. 1 Samuel 18, 12 says that Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but departed Saul. Saul removed him from his presence and made him commander of the thousands, and men uh, went out and came in before the people, and David had success in his undertaking because the Lord was with him. He's the one who blessed David and the one who brought Saul down. And he's active. David inquires of him. Chapter 23 says, David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph, and Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. This is the sovereignty of God. It can seem like a straitjacket to you that restrains you if your heart only desires what it desires. You'll be like Saul, you'll be like Peter. The frustration of knowing what God wants and knowing it doesn't line up what you want will become something that just restrains you and annoys you constantly if you're not following him. The sovereignty of God can be like a jail or it can be a feather bed. You can realize you can rest in the sovereignty of God when a king is trying to kill you. You can be in the valley of the shadow of death and say, God is sovereign. He is at work, he is active, he is good. When Saul goes the second time and David comes near him to kill him, it says in chapter 26, verse 12, David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. David wasn't safe because he walked quietly, because he has good soldiers, because he was courageous. He was safe because the Lord, the sovereign, was working through this. He's king of kings, he's active, he has a future for you. Don't, don't make the mistake that a king could make, that King Saul could make, to miss the king of kings. Don't make the mistake the people of Israel made, the people of God who heard the word preached, who understood the mercy and grace and power. They missed the king of kings. Don't believe just what your eyes see. We have a king who is there. Don't live just for yourself. Know the Lord. If character is provable, test the Lord. Lean on him. Seek refuge from him. Seek identity from him. And when you know him, the next thing that sequentially has to happen and only works in this order, you have the capacity then to love the Lord. When you become someone who knows the character of the Lord and you lean on him and you find how he loves you, the love of God is poured out for you in your behalf, you become one who loves the Lord. And again, sequence is important here. Know the Lord, love the Lord, and ultimately serve the Lord. Let your story become part of the Lord's story. Yield ultimately to that. Move away from the way that Peter and Saul lived. Move away from the way that Adam and Eve lived. 
who saw in Satan's lie that they thought they could do things just for themselves, and it failed. A story about us always ends in ashes and dust. It's the end of all men and women. But a story that's consumed in him always ends in glory. He is our king, the one provided for us to lead us, to defeat death, Satan, and sin, and to bring us to a place with him. The band's going to come up at this time, and we're going to celebrate communion. We, we saw how an ungodly king falls and meets demise. We, we saw a godly king rising with the promise and power of God. Now it's a chance to look on the king of kings, to see our Jesus, who, who came to be with us, took flesh upon him, who gave of himself on the cross to sacrifice that flesh for our sin, for the good of the people of God and the glory of God, who poured out his blood as a sign of forgiveness. There, there are going to be men and women who are holding the matzah, and when you come forward, if you're one who follows after the Lord, who has set your heart on him, who has sought him as your savior, you're welcome to this table. They will speak a simple truth to you, saying the body of Christ was broken for you. Make that a moment where you understand the goodness of the sovereignty of God, even in difficult situations, and embrace and take that. Someone else will be holding a cup of grape juice and wine for you to dip that matzah in according to your convictions, and they will speak a simple phrase to you. The blood of Christ, God's perfect son, was shed so that your sins can be forgiven. Dip the matzah into that and take that. And as that communion bread and wine goes into your system and feeds each cell of you, walk out of here with God not just being a slice of the pie of your life, but make your heart and life devoted to him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we confess that we have sought for kings who have looked good as an image and cast shadows on our eyes until we could not see you anymore. God, would you grant us grace to repent. We know that we can have forgiveness because of the mercy and justice of Calvary's cross, that you would pay for the sins of the worst sinners in the horrible, murderous, sacrificial death of your son Jesus, who would rise and take the throne of David forever. And this day, God, we confess we have a king who is with us, cares for us, and protects us. Call us, your people, to you again, Lord and speak to any who are here who don't know you to draw you and tell them to taste and see that the Lord, our God, our King, is good. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.